Welcome to Global Math Department. My name is Rana Arshad Hafiz and I'll be your host tonight. Tonight we are going to hear from Sunil Singh about utilizing math history to embrace equity, failure, and authentic problem solving in leadership communities. Would everyone please introduce themselves in the chat window telling us what you teach and where and what your Twitter handle is if you have one. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to explain how these meetings work. These meetings are recorded and are available within 24 hours after the meeting ends. To view the recording, you can use the same link you used to get here tonight. The global math community prides itself on being friendly and supportive. The chat room is available for topical and general conversation throughout the meeting. I'll be sure to catch your questions for the presenter to be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our speaker tonight is Sunil Singh. Sunil Singh is the author of The Pie of, of, Pie of Life, The Hidden Happiness of Mathematics and Math Recess, Playful Learning in an Age of Disruption. He also speaks to the hum humanity and wellness in the learning of mathematics. He's the president of the board of directors of the Human Restoration Project and works as a mathematics learning specialist for Scolab, a digital math resource company located in Montreal, and as well serves as an advisor to the Brooklyn-based Amplify in their development of a new K-12 curriculum. Before he embarked in a career of writing and speaking, he was a math and physics teacher for 19 years. Sunil? It's all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I guess before I start, um, it's really important for me to, um, you know, make sure and just my best wishes for all of you in terms of being safe and well, um, family, friends, neighbors. Uh, I'm sure some of you have stories. And uh, so the most important part is hopefully you are well. And, um, you know, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, this presentation that you're going to see was created um, last year, so a lot has obviously changed in the world, uh, which makes uh, a lot of the ideas, um, the themes that you're going to uh, see in this presentation and uh, for me to talk about um, have taken on a higher currency. Um, so, you know, just even this idea um, of this quote by Neil Peart, fellow Canadian, you know, we are in this rush, it seems like, to get somewhere. But as I was telling Rana before we started, we have to rush to stop. It almost sounds sort of nonsensical in terms of something Lewis Carroll might have said. But we have to stop. And we almost have to reset everything. So um, let's go. So um, even this image of all the pencils, colored pencils coming together is very symbolic of really um, what math history means in terms of uh, bringing it in, into our classrooms and our math communities. Um, it is going to make it something more colorful and it's gonna be um, a stronger illumination uh, of, of mathematics. So uh, I was very careful in terms of what do I wanna show as an image of what math history and storytelling can do in our math communities. So in order to go forward, especially now, uh, whatever forward looks like, um, we have to actually look back. And um, we have a lot to look back for. And the idea of check your blind spot isn't, uh, it's, it's, it's a metaphor, but it's actually something that, you know, if we don't check our blind spots when we're teaching mathematics, uh, not only we are going to miss a lot of stories, we are actually gonna sometimes teach things incorrectly. And so um, now that we have this time to really pause and reflect, I think it's really time to really understand why it's important uh, to look back. But there's a bit of a problem. From the student's point of view, there is no mirror. We, we, they have no mirror, rear view mirror to look at. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but 
you know, a math history was something which was usually like something in the margins of a textbook, you know, usually a white male, black and white sort of, you know, sketch or old photo and maybe two or three sentences, you know, uh, marginalized, which is exactly how math history was. It was marginalized. It wasn't woven into the curriculum. It wasn't woven in as part of communicating the beauty of mathematics. So we don't have any kind of template to go on. We almost have to start uh, anew. I, uh, I created this um, image uh, for many reasons. Um, again, if you look at the staircase model on the left-hand side, there's sort of, you know, this sort of, you know, hierarchical ascension from the bottom to the top. And that's the path that we all take. Uh, but if you look at the image on the right, um, this sort of Escher-like situation, that's the history of mathematics. That's how, you know, everybody who uh, went into mathematics, you know, before education went into it freely and openly and, you know, went different paths. And, you know, what if we did this in, uh, you know, starting in elementary school, you know, letting kids, uh, you know, wander through their interests and maybe there's a locked door, a blind alley, maybe they trip and stumble, but they come back through another door and we all share everything we've learned. Um, you know, this is not something new. This is the, the sort of the historical idea of mathematics and the idea of putting more play into elementary is completely uh, in simpatico uh, with that idea. Uh, so if you're gonna take anything from a presentation, um, I would almost say take this one image, this one word, cottawample. Um, and I love the image of uh, uh, Winnie the Pooh and Piglet taking a walk because it kind of describes where my own path in life and education is. Um, you know, I am traveling purposely, but I don't know where I'm going. And that allows me to be completely um, open to all possibilities and to, you know, unpredict your journey. So what has my journey been? My history, my journey, my history. Well, it starts with Mr. Scott, uh, my history teacher back in high school. And, you know, you have to remember this is before the internet. This is like, you know, before we just had Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, but why do I still remember whole uh, passages from his class because he told stories and they were gripping stories for all the students. Um, you know, he, he completely identified with our sensibilities as teenagers and then merged them with what he thought would be interesting, you know, knowledge and facts. So I'll, everything that I, in terms of me as a math educator at this point, I definitely owe to my uh, teacher, Mr. Scott. And I actually wrote an article about that uh, for the Medium blog that I write in. So, uh, yes, I was a math and physics teacher for 19 years, but I did quit. And in 2017, uh, the Globe and Mail, uh, Canada's largest newspaper, wrote, uh, allowed me to write an op-ed, why I quit teaching. And it's not important in terms of all the details, but um, I did quit. And, you know, when I started teaching, I, I didn't plan on quitting. And so I didn't know what um, uh, I wanted to do but I knew I didn't want to do that anymore. That to me did not represent teaching. It did not represent myself. It did not represent mathematics. It was a pretty empty sort of Venn diagram. There was no intersection. Uh, so I started something called the Right Angle, which was going to be the first uh, math store school in Canada. You know, 5,000 square feet, store, front up, uh, the store at the front, sold math games, puzzles, books, you know, all these things and had like classrooms in the back for uh, evening and uh, weekend um, sort of math circles. That's what I wanted to do. And uh, that's what I thought I was going to do until fate intervened. And then uh, two weeks before the grand opening, um, there was a fire in this historic building, which was built in 1871. and never had a fire up until um, two weeks. Uh, I think it was early March of 2015. And uh, I lost everything. And uh, I actually was standing uh, almost for where that picture was taken uh, because I got a call saying, you better come quickly, there's a fire. And, you know, I literally, you know, it's I can say that now, but it was hard to say it uh, years ago when I first started giving presentations, including this, I literally saw my, you know, dreams go up in smoke. And, you know, when you 
start to live your life through an impoverished lens, which was for the next few years, you reevaluate a lot of things. And one of the things I reevaluated was, what is mathematics going to mean to me? And so luckily, I did um, eventually uh, get a job working for a company um, uh, called Scholab in Canada. Uh, and uh, they were the first company that was doing math history. So it was a perfect fit. And uh, I was really excited about all the different projects uh, that were centered around the math history part. And uh, as uh, Rana mentioned, uh, that I now work for Amplify. They're out of Brooklyn. And they specifically want to have uh, want me uh, to uh, write and curate math history storytelling into their curriculum. So it's like I've finally found a place where I can merge all the things which have been very important to me in mathematics, the mathematic content, but also the storytelling history. So um, like the company I did work for, um, they're very vested in this math history. And what I like about them, they're very vested in terms of um, uh, especially uh, uh, local American heroes, which a lot of people may not have heard of. And I remember collecting hockey cards as a kid. And now these days, you know, you can get, if you play hockey, anyone can make a good card made up. And as soon as you put on a card, it kind of, you know, makes it really cool. So I think the idea of having math cards, math history cards, um, is a really nice way to showcase these wonderful uh, mathematicians um, from all different backgrounds. And the storytelling part starts really at the drawing board. Um, you know, 20 years ago, you know, math history wasn't even, like I said, on the radar. Uh, and we did not create curriculum like this in terms of storyboard visuals and seeing where we could put in, you know, the African salt trade into this kind of, kind of unit. These are the discussions, these robust discussions um, that are happening in terms of the kind of curriculum that we want to create. And then eventually you get to something which has a more finished look, but this is where the idea of storytelling um, is going to sort of ha have a home and a foundation. Uh, I did post this uh, on my Twitter uh, last uh, almost a month, a uh, month and a day ago, um, because there's a, around 500 unsolved math problems right now in the world. And uh, I looked that up. I just wanted to see how many there were. And there's about 500. And that's not surprising because the entire history of mathematics is based on failure, slow failure. And school is about fast success. And we shouldn't have to scratch our heads too much to wonder why things haven't worked out because students and teachers have not been given space and time to contemplate mathematics in the same way that it went through historically in terms of thematic development. And so, you know, I even, I've joked to teachers, we should rebrand math class and call it failure lab. What are we gonna do today? We're gonna fail. We're gonna fail like every single mathematician from every civilization background culture, which has ever existed. And we're gonna do it spectacularly. We're gonna come back again. It's far more disarming than having the idea of success. Um, so I think there's a couple of you, I know uh, um, there's a kindred spirit here, uh, Alex from Ottawa, who's quite familiar with this textbook. And um, I know you can't read uh, the, the intro, which is above it. Basically it says, and the, I don't think I've seen a textbook ever have this kind of um, guideline for students. Uh, this was in the back of the cumulative section problem. And really what it's saying is that some of these problems might take a couple of weeks to solve. And I've never seen that kind of um, guideline or comfort uh, in a textbook. And this is one of the problems that was in the back of the Cumulative Forums uh, section where you had to find the side of a square. And again, it's, it's decluttered, like, you know, it's just a square. Uh, you have a point P inside and, uh, you know, three, four, five units and three of the four vertices. Now, what's interesting about this problem is that uh, I shared it with a kindred spirit in Ohio named Chris Bolognese, and we were supposed to do an NCTM article about this, um, a problem to be solved, because there's more than uh, three, there's five, I think six ways to solve this problem. Uh, Chris uh, Bolognese is a, was a Desmos fellow, 
And <clears throat> you're thinking, why would I show a picture of looks like him uh, playing guitar uh, with a whole bunch of musicians? Well, a couple of reasons. One, um, that's him uh, uh, playing in a Beatles marathon he's done for seven years where he and his band plays every Beatles song from the beginning to the end. It's about 12 hours. And that's the idea of humanizing mathematics. And I'm going to get to more of that as we go through this. But I don't want people to think of people who study math as one dimensional. And that math is, um, you know, it's it's like w one of many other things that delight us. And, and, you know, when we talk about ourselves, you know, and even our students, what other interests they have, you know, maybe mathematics has to be merged into um, that as well. So I actually wrote a whole article about um, that uh, particular problem, the three, four, five problem, the uh, textbook, uh, mathematics, the year she lived. I taught for 19 years, and I'm not saying the other 18 she did not live, but that year where we gave, so let me just, because uh, I forgot to tell the story. <laughs> this is storytelling, right? Um, uh, if you want to talk about assessment, this is the best kind of assessment I've ever done of experience. So in 2002, we had a whole bunch of students in our, the geometry discrete class, and we were supposed to give a final exam. And these kids have already been accepted to university. You know, it's it's like beginning of May. They've checked out. And we didn't want to give like a cliche two, two and a half hour exam of the greatest hits to, to so that they can, you know, represent 30% of their mark. So basically what we did was we took 12 questions from the back, uh, myself and Peter Harrison, the person I taught with, and we gave these 12 questions to the students at the beginning of May saying five will be on the final exam in seven weeks. You have class time to collaborate. You can talk to any teachers or whatever. You just can't talk to us. And the results that we got in seven weeks when we gave the five questions were absolutely phenomenal. Not a surprise because kids had the freedom to think, to collaborate, to check the results, just like mathematicians have always done. So it was a kind of a one-off experiment, and that's why I call mathematics the year that she lived. So, you know, where there's no math, there's no freedom. We gave kids uh, plenty of freedom. They gave us back mathematics. Uh, changing gears a little bit, I'm still staying in storytelling and math history. Um, and so you might think, uh, you know, well, the Rolling Stones, how does that have to do with math history? You know, sometimes in math history, we, we tend to think of going back thousands of years. Um, well, the person on the left, some of you might recognize, um, that's Donald Coxeter, uh, almost the, the father of geometry. Uh, so many things are named for uh, Donald Coxeter. And of course, you have the Rolling Stones. And you might think, oh, there might be some connection, geometry, because uh, it looks like the that album, you know, it's a hexagon. And it was, I think, the first um, uh, non uh, sort of square polygon album shape, but there's something deeper into this. Um, they're connected by a very famous person, both Donald Coxeter and the Rolling Stones. And there's your clue, uh, a mathematician's guide to the Alhambra, and there's a nice little sort of image on the left-hand side. So this has something to do with the Alhambra. There's somebody who intersected the Alhambra in the career, which got the attention of Donald Coxeter and uh, specifically Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones. And it is M.C. Escher. Uh, M.C. Escher's life completely changed when he visited the Alhambra back in the late 20s. And uh, a, lot, a lot of his drawings reflected the sort of uh, amazing tessellations uh, that you can see in the Alhambra. And uh, Escher has talked a lot about that in uh, some of his own writings. And uh, there is the letter that uh, Mick Jagger penned to Moritz, uh, basically saying, I'm a big fan of your work. Now, you have to understand, you know, Jagger's not talking about the logarithmic spirals or the, you know, the trigonometry that's, you know, intensely in those drawings. Even Escher didn't understand the mathematics. That's why Coxter was somewhat flummoxed. Like, how are you drawing these things? Because they're very accurate to the mathematics that I just spoke about. And uh, so they, both these people, Jagger and uh, uh, Coxter, intersect at Escher. And why am I telling this story? Because you never know, there could be students in your class who come from a music background or have parents who um, listen to music. And if you weave in a story which involves some sort of pop culture, 
you never know what is going to hook them. Every student in your class has a different identity, has different interests. And it's important that we tell stories because sometimes we tell stories, you can overlap so many of the interests of these students. So um, that's a really cool letter. It was written in 19th. But unfortunately, Moritz uh, Escher did not uh, accept Jagger's request to have that as an album cover. So to go with the, uh, the hexagon that you did see in the previous slide. Um, I wonder how many of you can guess who this person is. Um, he is speaking at the largest uh, literary festival in the world in Jaipur. Uh, I love the fact that he's, looks like he's reading a very small book. Um, it's like, it's almost like he's offering up a, an ancient story that hasn't been told or hasn't been told in a while. Um, this person is probably maybe more known without his beard. That's Marcus Dusatoy. Um, I would strongly recommend that you uh, watch the story of maths, mathematics. Um, we can always discuss if it should be pluralized. Um, and it is a fabulous story um, because it's told in the storytelling voice, full of emotion, full of inflection, full of pause, um, some sorrow. And uh, it's, it's, it's what really got me into really finding more about math history when I watched this many, many years ago. And he's written lots of books too. Um, those are just uh, some of his books. Um, the, the prime number book, which is not there, is my favorite. Um, and, uh, you know, he has said something really important about storytelling. And I really like this quote. Because it's in that space, you know, that we do, uh, we create. And we find, you know, magic. And, uh, you know, it's really, really important to tell stories, uh, you know, whether it's mathematics, science, or whatever subject we teach. But mathematics has been the, the one discipline which has been sort of void of storytelling, uh, at least in a, sort of a, a class atmosphere. Uh, uh, maybe some of you uh, are big math history buffs and you already incorporate that in. But I really think Storytelling also allows us to be natural uh, in terms of when we talk about mathematics. Um, I've updated my presentation, as you can see, because um, this is a picture of the late, great John Horton Conway, who passed away earlier this year. You can't find this image on the internet. It's a screenshot of one of his uh, lectures. And I, I took a, it's at the 39 minute 42nd mark of a lecture that he gave on serial numbers. Um, and he starts to cry. It's a very powerful moment for me because he's not weeping about maybe his life, which has been filled with tragedy. Um, he's weeping because he's telling a story. And he's telling the story of his mathematical hero, uh, Cantor, um, who was one of the first uh people to start to unionize mathematics, to have organizations for it. And the first Congress um, that he organized, Cantor, uh, the French weren't going to show up. And this is the point where, for whatever personal reasons, Conway starts to cry. And then continues crying when the French delegation uh, led by uh, Poincaré uh, does show up. And then about two minutes after this, as he, go, he goes into, started going back in the serial numbers, he pauses himself and goes, you know what? Aren't these stories more fascinating than mathematics? He says that. Even though he's here at a university lecture hall to talk about serial numbers and the, the, you know, how he discovered them playing you know, games like Go, he really fell back on storytelling. And he shows his vulnerability and humanity um, by you know, obviously uh, uh, shedding some tears and telling the, he's not hiding it. He's telling the audience he is crying at this point. Um, but I can definitely send you the link of that video. Uh, if you'd like to see it, uh, we can definitely uh, do that. Um, another person, a story, um, and again, there's so many, so many stories. And uh, you know, it's not important that we know all the stories. It's more important that we want to know them. Um, I didn't, 
I didn't receive, you know, a, a, a sort of FedEx package with all this sort of math history. This is something that I've just sort of, you know, my own interest. Um, a, a lot of people, I'm going to take my cursor and hopefully you can see it. Very few people know that Pascal's triangle can be extended past the borders of the ones. And it goes into an infinite geometric series. The silver rule applies in terms of if you add the two numbers above it, you get the number below it. Um, but it, it creates a sort of, if you have now negative exponents, and if you have a binomial uh, raised to a negative exponent, it's going to be infinite geometric series. Try to Google it. Try to Google um, anything with Pascal's triangle, um, negative exponents expansion. I cannot find one image of it. This is almost becoming, this is from a textbook I used in the late 70s. It's almost like this knowledge is fading from our sort of existence, like in terms of like uh, searching for it. So I really ask it, you know, if you can find this idea of Pascal's triangle, the extension of it, because I can't find it myself. I have to take a picture, as you can see, of my old textbook. And uh, right beside it here, I have um, a book about the, the life of Pascal called Reasons of the Heart. Pascal a good his life after mathematics, he died at the age of 39. Most of his life was in pain. And he actually lived um, almost in uh, pain and poverty at the end. He sold this house. Um, he gave away so much of his stuff so the, the poor um, could could live because there was, a, there was a, a sort of a minor plague at the time in Paris. And he lived on the streets. And he was such a a uh, generous person. And that's the thing. We know Pascal for Pascal's triangle. He was more than that. He was a human being who had such sort of affinity for the poor and wanted to help them. And that's a part which, you know, isn't part of it. And maybe some people think it's not important, but I think if we're going to humanize mathematics, or sorry, rehumanize it, then we have to tell those kind of stories. So I love this quote. Uh, it was from a Harvard Business Review. I've just told some stories, and how can I connect with you? And then if we tell these stories to our students, how can we, how can we connect with them at the deepest level? And that's what storytelling does. Like this is my, these are um, my versions of the stories I've read. I'm not reading anything. I'm not reading passages from a book. I'm just trying to recall information that I've learned and that was sort of housed within me. Uh, so. I want to tell you this story. Um, I think most of you know Sophie Germain. I think most of you uh, kind of know the story about her. But one thing I doubt uh, in terms of Sophie Germain is if you've heard the story. And when I mean heard, someone tell it. Like you hearing the story from somebody else, um, and that person's going to be me right now. So this is my <laughs> story of Sophie Germain. Um, it's not like I've, I've made up stuff. This is how I tell the story. And this is how I've told the stories to kids. So it's 1789 in uh, France. You know, the revolution, the French Revolution is afoot. Uh, Sophie Germain is 13. The Bastille has just been taken over. Um, just like kind of... In, in, in strangely similar ways, um, it's not safe to be outside and walking around for different reasons. Um, so Sophie, who'd be normally playing it outside, um, is forced to stay inside. And she's 13 years old. And I don't know what kids did back then, but, you know, they must have played in the streets or just, you know, uh, but she wasn't allowed to do that anymore. So, you know, as any teenager, she's bored. And so she starts to sort of, you know, uh, uh, go and... Uh, explore her father's library, which I think was out of bounds. And she found that out pretty quickly. And uh, she comes across, you know, lots of different uh, textbooks. And, you know, she teaches herself uh, languages and, and mathematics. And she really got inspired by finding a, a story about Archimedes, whose supposed death, this is very sort of, you know, it's, it's a myth, but it's a, you know, myths are very powerful. Uh, that Archimedes supposedly died because he's so engrossed in a, a sort of a geometry problem in the sand that a soldier from Syracuse attacked him and killed him. And Sophie's a 13-year-old is going, how amazing or interesting could mathematics be that somebody not, uh, you know, uh, look out for their well-being and safety? That's that's the story that's there. Like, a, that's the turning point for Sophie Germain. 
And so now she starts to like, you know, wants to sort of learn about mathematics um, at nighttime, but her father especially doesn't want her doing that. So he starts stealing like the blankets and lamps and there's a cat and mouse game. And so Sophie is teaching herself like up to like first year university calculus under a blanket with some candles, it's dark with no support. Like, like you almost think that story is made up, but that's how she learned mathematics. And then five years later, she's 18 years old and the called Polytechnique opens up and uh, they accept, uh, you know, uh, correspondence work, but they still don't accept um, males. So she took on the nom de plume, Monsieur de Blanc, of a former student. And so she started uh, just writing to the Ecole Polytechnique for the problems. And she'd send solutions back in Lagrange. Another famous French mathematician was there. And he was completely impressed by this work of Monsieur de Blanc. And so, you know, Sophie Germain was really excited that her work was being recognized. Um, and then, you know, several years later, I, I think Gauss published a really, you know, prolific piece in 1801 about arithmetic. And, you know, uh, uh, he was just one year younger um, and Sophie Germain, they're both very young, talented mathematicians. And Sophie also, you know, letter, uh, sent letters to Gauss, but Gauss didn't really pay attention. And then 1807, fate intersects again because um, there's the sort of the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, so Gauss is in the town of Brauschwig. And Sophie, because uh, the French are occupying that town, thinks that Gauss's life is in danger. And so gets a, a family friend general to make sure that Gauss stays safe. Um, Gauss is kind of confused as to why this person is looking out for my well-being. Long story short, uh, Sophie finally confesses her gender to Gauss. And then Gauss writes back one of the most amazing letters that should be inside every textbook as inspiration, um, basically commending Sophie Germain for um, taking and tackling on um, uh, mathematics and sciences with all the prejudices. And the, the last... Uh, words of that letter are to the effect of saying to Sophie that, you know, it, that she, Sophie Germain, doubtless, has the most noble courage, extraordinary talent, and superior genius. Like that, that whole story is real. And the ups and downs, the heroism, and then we have this quote from Sophie Germain, you know, it matters who first arrives at an idea, rather what is significant is how far an idea can go. And that's ironic because Sophie Germain was the first mathematician who started looking at a grand plan for proving Fermat's theorem as opposed to maybe case by case. Of course, she never got there, but that's what she started. And she didn't want credit for that or believe credit was like that. You know, it's more important is how far the idea can go. So there's no ego with Sophie Germain. And, uh, you know, that's why to me, she's one of my favorite mathematicians, just because um, she started when she was young and it was by fate, not under the best circumstances. And, you know, this is the person that she became. And, you know, and she went on to do so much more, especially in uh, elasticity and physics as well. Uh, this is a, a really cool site. It's called Awesome Math Girl, just related to stuff which in terms of female mathematicians, some of you may have come across this. Uh, really well done, very bright, cheery. Uh, and it's uh, Mira Desai uh, is the person who hosts the website. So if you want to sort of, you know, inspire, um, you know, uh, girls in the classroom and teachers, um, this is a really good site. So I'm gonna ask you a question now, since we're at the halfway mark, to do some math. Um, What's the largest and smallest number you know? Now think about that. The largest and smallest number you know. Hmm. Okay, we'll start with the largest one. It's a it's a great question to ask your students, right? Like, what 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 are they going to come up with? Infinity? You know, with, infinity is not a number. Um, but let me go to the largest. So I love this pic picture. Um, it has to do with Graham's number. I'm not getting into Graham's number, but it has to do with coloring lines and trying to avoid a certain configuration. And you know, when you move a, a, a two-dimensional object in space, then it becomes a three-dimensional object. If you move a three-dimensional object in space, it becomes four-dimensional. You know, it becomes a hyper hypercube or, or a tesseract. And you can keep doing this infinitely, right? Um, and so 
avoiding a certain configuration occurs in the 13th dimension. And this number of towering exponents of threes, you know, we're just like maybe a little ways down from the sun, we're only bigger than Googleplex. And this number, by the way, uh, tower of threes going to sun is not Graham's number. It's not even the beginning of Graham's number, but it's getting to Graham's number. And, you know, sometimes we need to talk about the lore of large numbers to captivate students. Like, wow, there's a number that big? Yes. And it can it usually starts off with a problem they can understand. And Graham's uh, number is a problem they can understand, but I'm just not going to go into detail in it uh, right here. So the smallest number, there's a perfect picture to explain the smallest number. And if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, we have a familiar face. It's Marcus de Satoy. And um, he's in uh, the historic uh, town of Gallor, uh, where there's a fort. And I think a lot of you know where I'm going with this. So zero is the smallest number. And this is where the history of mathematics, we took a little bit of a, you know, it's that, what's that Bugs Bunny scene? I should have made a left at Albuquerque. Well, yeah, well, we should have made a left at Albuquerque in terms of math history, in terms of Indian mathematics. Um, this is Jonathan Crabtree. Uh, he's an Australian. He's done much, much research on uh, Indian uh, Vedic mathematics, especially Brahmagupta, um, because zero <laughs> was supposed to be the smallest number. And if you think about it, um, if you teach science, an electron has a charge of negative one, proton plus one. We don't think of the electron as being less. It's all about balance. And, you know, the minus one plus one gives you the zero. So, you know, integers in North America, we don't do them till seventh or eighth grade. Well, the problem is because we didn't really understand or get the full translation of zero. We only got it as a placeholder. Nobody took all of the information of zero um, from the East to the Arabic world, to Europe. And so zero was not even considered a number. Even one wasn't even considered a number um, around uh, you know, 15th, uh, 16th century. And that's why we've been this kind of sort of, you know, boondoggle um, with the way that we approach uh, integers. You know, negative should be taught simultaneously with positive values. And the best way to explain this is something which uh, Jonathan Crabtree created. It's called the Brahma Guptan plane, quote unquote. Uh, what I like about it, it's a very familiar sort of Cartesian plane. And, you know, he uses that to show positives and negatives being multiplied in terms of... Uh, debt, you know, and uh, debt subtracted n number of times. And that's why when you, you know, if you have debt and, uh, you know, that's being reduced, reduces negative, then you've got this positive thing, uh, area model. So visually in terms of showing um, all the laws of zero and how they intersect. Uh, so Jonathan Crabtree, definitely follow him on Twitter. He's got lots of free stuff to share about zeros and uh, he's got lesson plans and, you um, uh, he'd be very, very happy to uh, connect with him. Uh, he's on uh, Twitter at, uh, I think, Jonathan Crabtree, but there's not a lot of Jonathan Crabtrees out there. Uh, so I have an uh, uh, easy theoretical question and a hard practical question about bread because we want to get an authentic problem solving. Uh, if you have four loaves of bread and five people, how much bread does each person get? Well, the quick and correct answer, you know, is four-fifths, right? But imagine the bread. Um, four people got almost whole loaves, and the fifth person got like all the shards from each of the five loaves. Um, sorry, each of the four loaves. So it's not entirely equitable. So the hard practical question is divide the bread equally and equitably so that each person has the same number of slices, and those slices look the same. Now, if that question looks a bit challenging, and it is a little bit challenging, um, I'll give you a simpler one. And I've done this at Family Math Nights. So um, get the Unifix cubes, I'm sure, that you have in your classroom, and give students uh, two sticks of six each. So two loaves of bread would each has six cubes. And ask them to divide among three people. And I'll bet you that picture is the most common picture students will do. 
And it's correct. Everyone did get, um, you know, two thirds of a loaf, right? Um, and you can't glue the bread back together. So there's one person who did get like, you know, the shards. That is the most common one. But the one that kind of shows the idea of Egyptian fractions is this one. That one you will not get as often, even though that's got the most equal distribution of having one half plus one sixth equals two thirds. And this is a, it's a very simple example, but it really is very powerful visually and especially with the manipulatives and tactile of going, wow, I never thought of that. And the idea of now unifraction becomes, okay, well, what are unifractions? Well, there's a history of the unifractions, which is Egyptian fractions. So you go down that rabbit hole by doing a little bit of history. Um, now you can go into Egyptian fractions. So speaking of which, um, I don't know if uh, anyone recognizes this. Um, it seems like a kind of a throwaway. Okay, I know 4 over 2 equals 1 over 1 plus half plus half. Um, but what about this next one? The 4 is constant. 4 is not moving, and my denominator is, and if my fractions obviously are as well. Well, this is the... Um, Erdős Strauss conjecture and basically says that any fraction written four over n, uh, n is greater than or equal to two, can be written as a sum of three unit fractions. They don't have to be different; they can be the same. So you know, we always want kids to have this sort of fraction um, kind of literacy. But, and so why don't we intersect actual math problems, conjectures, history with it? It'd be fun for kids to come up with unit fractions of you know at least up to you know four over two, four over three, four over four maybe four over five, it'd be a puzzle and kids would create their kind of solutions and they would spend more time with these problems just like actual mathematicians because there's something authentic about it. There's something real about it um, because there isn't any sort of fake context attached to it. It's just uh, solving a problem. So uh, the next problem I'm gonna tell you, it, it's, called the, it's called the simplest impossible problem. Um, there has been some recent headway made in it but a lot of people have been told to stay away from this problem, uh, like in terms of uh, seasoned mathematicians. Um, so it's called the Colatz conjecture or the hailstone sequence. Some of you might have heard of it. So if you take any number, uh, and I'll start off with one, I'll just give one to myself, uh, let's say seven. If the number is odd, you have to multiply it by three and add one. So seven is odd, seven times three is 21, plus one is 22. You always have to multiply by three and add one if it's odd. So seven gave us 22. If you are even, which we are now are, we have to divide by two. So there's only two rules. Multiply by three, add one if it's odd, divide by two if it's even. So 22 becomes 11. 11's odd becomes now 34. And 34 divided by two becomes 17. 17 times three uh, is 51 plus one is 52. 52 is going to give us I'm hoping everything, why is it doing? It's doing a security scan here. I don't want a security scan. Hopefully everyone can still hear and see me. Sorry about that. Um, so 52 gives us 26. 26 gives us 13. 13 gives us 40. 40 gives us 20. 20 gives us 10. 10 gives us 5. 5 is odd, means multiply by 3, add 1, gives us 16. 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. All the sequences collapse down to 1. Every single number, that's the conjecture, has been proven. It, we've done it to like the first million beyond numbers. They all collapse down to one. Um, if you take the number 27, 27 has a hailstone sequence that goes into the thousands and doesn't come back for a while. I think it's like over 100 uh, numbers in a sequence. So, you know, again, practicing basic math, uh, you know, stuff like multiplying uh, by three, adding one, dividing by two, those are skills we want kids to have, mental math. Again, put in the context of authentic problem um, that uh, Lothar Collatz, I think it was 1937, he came up with it. So what have I been doing? I've been doing storytelling, which is linked to humanization. And hopefully if I've been telling these stories and there's a sense of humanization among us, then there's a sense of belonging. And once you get the sense of belonging, it really gives the, um, the conditions for curiosity. So here's a book, the introduction of a book I've marked up pretty, you know, in terms of colors. Um, and I'll share with you what the book is in a second. To me, it's my, it's my go-to. Um, it's, it's a dense read. It's primarily for high school teachers, but it's a really good resource to have. 
Um, but I, I really love the intro of it. A justification, that's a strong word, a justification for this book. And that first sentence right there, interest in history marks us for life. It doesn't matter what history, if it's told the story, we are marked by it. If it's our own history or someone else's history, we have more empathy for it. And so the book I'm talking about um, is Crest the Peacock. And um, there's three editions. I, the first edition is super, super expensive, but I would recommend getting a third one because it has over 500 pages now. And it's just a wonderful resource to have, uh, especially if you're a high school math teacher, but even for a middle school teacher, um, just some of the ideas that you might have thought, um, you know, were appropriate to maybe Western mathematicians actually go further back into, uh, you know, uh, Middle Eastern Islamic mathematicians or, or Eastern mathematics. So it's called Crest the Peacock, Non-European Roots of Mathematics. So um, I thought I'd give you a, another math question. Um, how many different ways uh, to get up these eight steps? Um, as you're going to see, I, I purposely took this picture, which has eight steps. And what I mean by that, you're allowed to go up the steps by either uh, taking a step of one or a step of two. So those are the only kind of st uh, steps you're allowed, one step or two steps. So one way to do it is simply take like eight consecutive steps of one. So as long as your total is eight, then you've got up the steps. Um, another way is you could have done one, 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 and then do a last jump of two, right? That's, it's eight. So there's lots of different ways and kids could list them and that's great. But really it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's you might miss one. So we always in mathematics, we always start with a simple problem. So um, when there's uh, one step, there's only one way. And uh, so normally I would do this actually as an actual problem with teachers, uh, but I'm showing the results now and I'm showing all the different results. And you're probably thinking, okay, I do recognize those totals. Those are the Fibonacci numbers, right? <laughs> those famous uh, numbers we've seen so often. They are, but he, Fibonacci, Leonardo of Pisa, was not the person who discovered them. Um, it was actually found by Pingala. It might have been Himachandra, but it was basically founded by Indian mathematicians, uh, sorry, Sanskrit poets, uh, who studied uh, Sanskrit poetry for long and short vowels. How many different ways can you make a poem if you have a short vowel one step or long vowel two steps? That was the question I just gave you with the steps. So um, they were analyzing Sanskrit poetry uh, back, you know, six, 700 years before uh, Fibonacci discovered them. And remember, Fibonacci, learned of Pisa, he was hanging out uh, at the uh, African ports, Bogia, with his dad. So he was uh, completely immersed in all the stuff that was coming from the traders and merchants, uh, the Islamic mathematicians. Um, so he got a lot of that stuff from there, and the Islamic mathematicians got it from the East, and that's the whole trajectory of it. And so again, just telling the story um, anecdotally sometimes of what sort of how people got the information. Um, this is an aerial view of the Baila village in Zambia. Again, uh, it was taken by fluke. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't know if people have seen this, but uh, this is basically, um, the person I will tell you in a second, uh, he was on a Fulbright scholarship and he was, you know, looking at stuff in Africa and they took just some overhead pictures while they were in a plane or a helicopter. So there's some, a, lot, a lot of fractal imagery here, right, uh, in terms of how the village is constructed in Zambia. Uh, well, it turns out that was just the tip of the iceberg, um, that the idea of fractals is indigenous to African cultures. Um, that's an Ethiopian cross. And to the right of it is uh, an antenna, a uh, cell phone antenna inside. I mean, if it wasn't for fractals, we wouldn't have cell phones. We'd have cell phones which have antennas like six, seven feet that stick out, which have various kind of different lengths of them to catch all the different frequencies. So thank you for fractals. But fractals are part of African culture, uh, you know, way, way before, you know, uh, Mandelbrot. So again, this is a very powerful image for me. You know, uh, the idea of inclusiveness, culture responsive curriculum, identity, and linking it to something that you know most of us are familiar with. So there is the book, Ronnie Glash, and I love this little quote from him, you know, especially at the end, just get out of their way. I think we should get out of the way of our students once we give them all the tools and uh, you know, 
resources they need and let them become curious problem solvers as much as mathematicians did. So um, yeah, I definitely do. And this is a really uh, good book too. It goes into far more detail um, and than even his TED Talk, uh, which is now I think about 10 years old. Uh, I normally don't put a lot of text up in my slides and I don't want you to read this, but I, it's, it's such a, it's part of a longer, longer, longer conversation. Um, but really it's about, um, as you can see the word alienation right in the middle of your screen, right? Well, what leads to this alienation? Well, see, the thing is a lot of people think alienation comes after anxiety. Alienation is the precursor to anxiety. Kids check out of mathematics. And uh, what PDT, which I'll tell in a second who he is, he's saying is because we don't teach mathematics like English. In English, you choose the best books, poems, uh, narratives first, and design, um, then the course is designed from that. Well, in mathematics, we sort of, you know, uh, sort of ch choose the curriculum um, based on a textbook. You know, um, the, the book is written afterwards where what PDT is saying is, wh why aren't we taking the best problems, the mathematical poems first and giving them to the kids? And that's why he talks about alienation. And who is PDT? Um, that's Peter Taylor of uh, Queen's University, um, who's still teaching there in his early 80s. Um, and this is something which really resonated with me because I only came across this recently, that excerpt uh, interview. He actually teaches poetry as well at Queen's University and his line by line comparisons of poetry with mathematical proofs. So I'm um, not too surprising, yes, alienation does occur before difficulty in learning mathematics in school. And there he is, um, he did win an award, the Adrian Pouillet Award in 2006, because he was really talking about the aesthetics. And the aesthetic again is linked to beauty of mathematics. And one of the things which is also beautiful is the idea of storytelling. Um, so yes, definitely the idea of making mathematics uh, more artful. Um, I just want to quickly get to the primes because um, my I've, my daughter just loves prime numbers and they have a whole history themselves in terms of when primes get discovered, specific, specifically Mersenne primes, that they actually become part of our culture in terms of stamps. That's how important they are in terms of finding them. And this one, which was written in my daughter's hand, was discovered last year, the 51st, the largest Mersenne prime ever found. Um, I joked with my daughter, even if you tried to punch this number in your calculator, even if your calculator could hold all the digits uh, and had a wide enough screen, it would take you eight months of punching in two times two times two times two times two, 82 million times and subtracting one to get that Mersenne prime. I blew her mind when I said that. And that was my point. I wanted to like, you know, her remember a story about her dad telling about Mersenne primes that hopefully she'll remember because it was through sort of this sort of narrative and storytelling. Um, two quotes, uh, which uh, uh, from the same person, um, always try our problems that matter most to you. Are we giving students the, the choice to choose their problems? That's one of the definitions of play. You know, it has to be self-chosen, self-directed. So maybe once a week, kids can work on their own kind of math problems. Uh, individually, in groups, uh, paper and pencil problem, manipulative problem, uh, maybe a Martin Gardner problem. So, uh, and the person who said the longer quote about mathematics, there's a lot of darkness in that quote, right? Um, that's Andrew Wiles. Um, sorry, I didn't, I should have mentioned in, in a slide, but that was Andrew Wiles who said both those quotes. Uh, the person who solved Fermat's last theorem and was published in 1993. Um, so, stories. How important are they? Um, and I like that Bromian ring picture um, because it involves all three of us. Whatever our stories are, whatever our, our backgrounds are, um, limited, um, challenging, we all have stories. And they all intersect with the story of mathematics somehow in terms of uh, humanizing it far more. And... Uh, Anthony Bourdain was a huge influence on me. I actually met him in 2005. And uh, his quote is very aligned to the quote, the beginning that I mentioned uh, from Neil Peart, right? It's never to arrive. And that's what I, it, it's as you get older, you do realize this organically. 
So how can I, we, take this notion of having so far yet to go and not arriving into uh, our classrooms? Well, first of all, it makes us human, makes us vulnerable, and disarms us, uh, disarms our classroom. And just to let you know, uh, uh, I wrote four articles, five articles this month. Um, and you can see that they're all leaning towards our history, our math history and why it matters. And, uh, you know, the one that I wrote the most recently is Algebra, the Great Education Tragedy. It's on Medium. Uh, again, part of it is talking about the history of algebra, that, you know, we'd, we've neglected it from where it's gone, from Babylonia to Islamic mathematicians to Descartes, the whole storyline there. Um, so uh, this will be available in about a couple of weeks. Uh, I've written an e-booklet, a white paper uh, for Amplify, um, which is really why this has to be in our classroom. Uh, building connections and curiosity through storytelling, making space for all students to see, see themselves in mathematics. Um, and uh, I've touched upon it a little bit here, but it goes into it far uh, in a more deeper way. Uh, and that'll be out in a couple of weeks. So I just want to give you a, a sneak peek of this, uh, what the title page will look like. And then this is a, a book which uh, I will have out in fall 2021. Uh, and it's really, again, aligned to the idea of, you know, never arriving, of, of chasing rabbits. And, uh, you know, if you look at the first chapter, ready, set, stop, well, we don't go till the end. So what does that mean? Well, I guess we have to wait till next year, right? So I thought I would leave with a quote, Neil Pert, because I start, opened with one. Uh, this is him on an end of a sort of a, a trip, a bicycle trip. I think he's in Western Africa. And it's not songs from the song Closer to the Heart. So really that's what we're doing. And, you know, instead of, you know, philosophers and plowmen, maybe it's uh, math educators and administrators. Each must do their part to build a new reality closer to the heart. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sunil, for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, we have a couple of minutes for a couple of questions. If there are any questions you may want to take. Sure. I think Ranjani has a couple of questions for you there. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. Go ahead, Ranjani. So next week, our webinar would be, uh, our presenter would be Teresa Wills, and she would be talking about rich math tax, tasks and five practices in online teaching. Everyone in attendance, thank you so much for attending, and you will be receiving a recording of this webinar through, the, through your um, email link. So I really like uh, Ranjani's questions, very honest, and it's, yes, I can see it. And thank you, thank you for sharing that question. And it's a question I'm sure other uh, people uh, feel. Uh, first of all, you, you know, as I mentioned, I, I didn't come with this kit of math stories. Um, I wasn't taught math history. Um, I loved math, hist I loved history, but I never really included the beginning of my teaching career. So this is something which was slowly built. You know, and what's really important more is not to you necessarily house the stories, but you have curiosity for the stories and tell it in your own voice. And you know, even if it's you don't think you're a good storyteller, honesty and mutual being a mutual learner are the two most important qualities of being a teacher. That was told to me by my faculty of education teacher back in 1992. Not knowledge, not all these things, being a mutual learner and having honesty. So really, you might come across something that you want to share to your students. That's how it starts. You don't have to start with a whole encyclopedia of knowledge. You can just start with one or two stories. You can start with um, math history cards. It starts somewhere. And I think the way you um, ask that question with such uh, candor shows, I think, to me that you're almost already ready uh, to embrace this. But yes, I understand the classroom in terms of feeling rushed and all that. But uh, hopefully there will be uh, supports in terms of curriculum uh, material that tells you how to do that in a classroom 
which doesn't take up too much of your time. So we are coming to the top of the hour on this. Thank you so much, Sunil, for sharing your work with us here. Um, and as I said earlier, we will be sending a recording of this uh, webinar. It will be available to you via the same link that you use to register for the webinar. Thank you, everyone, for being here with us tonight. Thank you.